thank you for being present as we gather here today. Lord, you know each of us. We are dependent on you. And our trust in you completely. As we surrender to you, we ask that you would come by your Holy Spirit and inspire our hearts today. Come fill our lives with your love and fill this place with your presence. We ask this in your glory and praise. And all God's people said, Good morning. Good morning. It's good to have everyone here, including Reed. <laughs> that was beautiful. Thank you, Reed. Um, I'd just like to give you a little clue on this beautiful lady. She plays at no charge because of her love to God and how he has blessed her life. Um, today's announcements are Baptism of the Lord, Noisy Bucket, Monday Crochet Group at 11.30, Wednesday Bible Study 6 a.m. at Leo, and Bible Study here at the Top Lawn at 4 p.m. Upcoming events, the Leadership University is by Zoom, Saturday, January 28th at 9 to 12. Saturday, February 11th, 9 to 12. These free identical workshops are open to all in the North District. See the flyer for more information, and if you'd like to sign up, see here. Be sure to check your mailboxes. Check your bowl bulletin for more announcements. Be sure to have your bulletin and hymnal for the month of January. Um, Karen is taking a little break, even though she's back there. <laughs> um, I would like to tell you our last hymn will be in the United Methodist hymnal It'll be 723. I doubt it has a different number of different books. Is there any other announcements? I would like to let fill you in a little bit. Um, Pastor went to the realtor and picked up the forms that we need to finalize this sale of the parsonage. So with the trustees, we're going to try and get that all put together today. So just to keep you updated. They have been pre-approved, so we know that they can buy it. It's just a matter of all the paperwork. Are there any other announcements? Would you stand and pass the peace sign? <laughs> Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre. 
Make melody to him with the harp of ten strings. For the word of the Lord is upright, and all his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth all their host. He gathers the waters of the sea and the deep. He goes to the deep in the storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. Our first hymn, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise, United Methodist Hymnal, 103. Thank you, God. 
Um, our next hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, hymn 400. Anna's family in our purse yeah, with Sandy's person.
Trevor Frick and Marty Kenner. And on our prayer list, we're going to leave off the Shirley's little kitty. Obviously, the little fellow's got to have some uh, some healing grace coming his way because he's a little brain bunch and had to do some extra steps to get those claws out. It's not supposed to do some extended uncomfortableness. But we pray for that little kitty. We also pray for Shirley's sister on Naomi and the wing. She's coming up on this, these, these health issues that need to be addressed. Prayers for that successful surgery. The Annis family, and of course, Jack and Ted, her boys, um, as they suffer this loss. Georgia Bacho, Michael Collinger, Jennifer Creel, Karen Dantino, Dick and Mary Alice Fletcher, Carl Newman Dorgan, Don Horner, Ron Huffer, Greg Zerzak, Ralph and Mary Beth Kiffelwood, Shannon and Joyce Klein, Emily Kopeck, Daryl and Judy Kroger, Karen Lapkowitz, Tom and Fran Lapkowitz, Tom and Metcalf, and Nikki Sicknor. With that, I'd like to say a little prayer and bow our heads. How the God to come before you is a humble people. Lord, your children know that it's utterly impossible be successful in this world without you. Lord, we pray on behalf of the ones that we've named here that you would offer them your grace, your mercy, your love, and provide them with what they need. As we do not know all of their needs, we only know some. Lord, we know that you know all. You know us. You created us. And you know what we need to sustain life. Lord, on our behalf, we ask this in their name, that they may feel your love in their life. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. With that, I would like to recite the Lord's Prayer as he has taught us to pray. We can bow our heads. Father God, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. That will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us for our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever.
Thank you. Thank you. Our second reading comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 9, verses 9 through 12. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners come and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, it is not the healthy who need the doctor, but the sick. This leads me right into my sermon title this morning. <clears throat> Levi. You see, this is the first account of Matthew. Now, what I learned to do in this preparation is that Matthew was also known as Levi. The tax collector. When Jesus encounters Matthew, he simply says two words. Follow me. And Matthew gets up and follows him. It seems like an easy choice for Matthew. He doesn't hesitate. He doesn't ponder the ramifications of doing such a he simply just gets up and begins his journey. For us, this doesn't seem like much of a big deal. But what we fail to realize here is that Matthew was seemingly walking away from something that we You see, being a tax collector at this time, in this period, was what they call a lucrative career. It was also despised by the Jewish people. Scholars believe that most, if not all, tax collectors overcharged. This is how they were rewarded. In keeping with that excess for themselves. Plus the fact that the taxes were Roman taxes. They belonged to Rome. And again, the Jews and the Romans did not see eye to eye. So then the question to be pondered, right? Why, but why did Jesus call Matthew, also known as Levi? Question. You almost don't get the sense that Jesus knew who Matthew was. He just walked in, seen Matthew in his tax collector's booth, looked at him, maybe, maybe possibly even made eye contact, and said, follow me. You see, it's not really clear, but first we have to understand the reason why Matthew was appointed as a tax collector. You see, that skill set required something very specific about someone. They had to be, first off, good with money. Because they were going to be dealing with money constantly. Now, when we think somebody good with money, we think of an accountant or uh, somebody like that, maybe a bank teller or somebody that works in a bank. But what it really means to be good with money is to be able to add and subtract money values for because the Romans were absolutely certain the tax collectors must fulfill that tax. You don't want to be a tax collector that does not receive or take what is due to Rome. Because you wouldn't be in that position for long. Just like if we went to the bank, and every time we made a deposit at the bank, the teller would you know, sneak a few dollars 
I don't want to be positive. And then the next thing you know, when we check our deposit, hey, what's going on? We're a few short here. That's kind of what tax life was all about in Jewish time. You make this dumb deposit, you pay this X amount, I scrape a little off for myself, and then the Roman gets what they want. So you don't want to short Rome. But it was an important job. These tax collectors had to be good with numbers and currency. They had to be excellent record keepers. Now, when you say somebody that keeps record, you might say somebody that's really good at documentation, or maybe their written word is very, very clear and understandable of what they did. Really, somebody that keeps a very accurate record. So you can kind of get a picture of who this Matthew was. He was intelligent. He handled money well. He documented things very clearly. And these were the skill sets that were needed. So why did Matthew get these skills? Where did they come from? Was he trained to be a tax collector? Or was it naturally inherent in his skills? The skills that Matthew has been using will come to a value in the kingdom. Not in the way that Rome was using those skills, but what it can do to benefit me and you for the kingdom. Matthew was using the skill sets that God blessed him with to help Rome. But Jesus changed all that when he simply said, Come follow me. Where do you see this benefit of Matthew? Well, when you read the Gospel of Matthew, you pick up on those details. You pick up on the ability to write things accurately. Be able to have a very authentic, detailed account of Jesus' ministry. From Matthew's point of view. You see, in doing my research and preparing for the sermon, I came across something that I found pretty interesting. Both Matthew, also known as Levi, and who they refer to a lot of times as little James, were both noted in Scripture as being sons of Alphaeus. Now, we can make that distinction that they possibly might have been related as brothers. Because both Levi and little James were the sons of Alphaeus. Now, it didn't say that they were both from Alphaeus. It just said they were sons of Alphaeus. Now, is it possible that we have two Alphaeus in the same time frame? Yeah, it is possible. But, so we can speculate possibly they were brothers. But where it really comes into clarity here is when we read Matthew 10 for you, it says... And again, the skills that Matthew has really shine through because this is where he really lists all of the disciples by name. In 10.3 it says, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew the tax collector, and James, son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus. Now, you would think that if they were related or brothers, he probably would make note of that here. By simply saying, my brother James, the son of Alphaeus, but he doesn't. So we can speculate here possibly that even though they were both sons of Alphaeus, obviously they had to be two different people with the same name. This seemingly would be noted by someone, again, who was meticulous at detail. And this would be an opportunity to do that. What seems the most important aspect of Matthew and his willingness to follow Jesus is his understanding of the cost that he will have to pay to do so. You see, to follow Jesus, Matthew makes a monstrous monetary choice. Could you imagine being in a position in your life where you're making pretty good money? You live a pretty comfortable life. You have a nice house. You have nice clothes. You eat every day. 
You might even have a servant. And because Jesus approached you and said, follow me, he left all that behind. Now, seemingly working your life up to that point, that would be a would be a good decision for most of us to make. To just walk away. But when we read this account of Matthew, there is no time for discernment. There is no time of thinking about it. There isn't weeks that pass. There isn't months and years working up to that point. It's almost instantaneous. Follow me. And he gets up. And follows him. To follow Jesus, Matthew makes that huge choice. He chooses to walk away from the things that he knows, the comfortable life that he's built, and of course, all of the nice things that surround him. This, in fact, is the reason I believe most people can relate to Matthew. Because this is what we strive for. We strive for monetary value. We strive for the comfortable things in life. We strive for the nice houses, the cars, the bikes, the vacations, the nice clothes. That's really what we're we're driven to do. To follow Jesus, Matthew give all of that up instantly. For someone to fully understand what they are giving up to do that, undoubtedly it would have been Matthew. Somebody who was meticulous in detail, good with money, accurate in record keeping, living that life understanding everything that he's had, understanding dealing with people on a day-to-day basis. This is based on what we know about Matthew the tax collector. What I find to be most interesting about Matthew is the reaction to Jesus. His instant acceptance to walk away from all that he knows. One encounter. One moment. To follow someone he just met. This isn't somebody that he's created a relationship with and had several interactions with. This is the first encounter. The first time he meets him. Then he hosts him and his followers at his house, along with other tax collectors and sinners. This action shows me one thing about Matthew that really gets me fired up. And that is, when he chose to follow Jesus, his first reaction was to share. Share the excitement that he has in knowing that Jesus shows him. He hosts a party. He invites his friends. He invites Jesus and his followers to come over, share, break bread with me. Let's all have this conversation. Let's all talk. Let's all, let's all mingle with one another. To me, that shows me that Matthew was genuinely excited about who Jesus was. He was so excited that he shared that news. This in itself is what Jesus calls us to do. Go and share the good news. So imagine you, wealthy. Now, wealth means different things to different people. When we talk about wealth, we talk about being comfortable. We talk about having enough money to do what we want to do in life. That's really what wealth is. Now, for some of us who like to travel and maybe go to Hawaii and own a house on the beach and you know maybe have a couple different cars we can drive every few hours of the day, 
that wealth might be pretty astronomical. For some of us who would rather just live in a small two-room cabin on the top of a mountain where nobody bothers us, that wealth might be significantly less. Whatever that wealth is for you. But when we talk about wealth, we talk about someone who is comfortable. They've worked, they've earned, they're wealthy, they're comfortable. <laughs> That's what Matthew gave up to walk away. Now, would you imagine striving for your entire life for that seemingly goal? You've achieved it. And now, because of the stranger that you just met, See, Matthew wasn't concerned about what it means to be a follower. He absolutely understood the cost. But yet he was more excited to share it and what it means to be chosen by Jesus. It doesn't go into account that Matthew had regular house parties at his house and shared with his friends. As soon as the stranger walked in and said, Come follow me, he throws a party. He's pretty excited. Which brings us to one of the very first public events that puts Jesus' ministry into question with the Jewish leaders. You see in verse 12 and 13 of that Matthew, St. Matthew 9, Jesus responds to that question that the Pharisees asked, and this was his response. On hearing this, Jesus said, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what it means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. This, of course, starts that rift between Jesus and those leaders. This also underlines as to why these folks struggled so greatly, so significantly with Jesus and who he was. They, the Jewish leaders, are so stuck in their sin that they can't see. The leaders have placed themselves in such a pedestal. And I've given you guys that picture before of these Jewish leaders and how they're depicted in Scripture that they are men of stature, wealth. They have these flowing robes and clothes, the very finest of things. And they do not dare be seen with the sinners of the common people. They separated themselves so badly. They separated themselves not only from the people, but from God Himself. <clears throat> what really throws these leaders off is the statement Jesus makes: "I desire, I desire mercy, not sacrifice." Of course, everything that we know about Old Testament laws and rules talks about the sacrifice. At all these major festivals, there's a sacrifice. For certain things that you want to receive from the sacrifice, you sacrifice certain things. But there is a sacrifice. You see, the leaders would have been well-versed in this because this is where they spend the bulk of their time, understanding those old scripture laws. They knew those laws like the back of their hand. They knew what sacrifice meant. They knew what sacrifice mean. They also knew what sacrifices were required. And again, they're stuck. 
They're stuck in what they know, what they read, what they believe and understand, but they can't see the things have changed. They can't see that God has made an adjustment coming to them. Which brings us to the real reason of Jesus. The people had lost their way. They had become so caught up in their actions, they have forgotten the reason for those actions. And I think a couple of things that really bring it home for me is a couple of scriptures that talk about this desire and offering and sacrifice. The first one we find is in 1 Samuel, chapter 15, verses 22. And it says, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? Question mark. And then it goes on to say, to obey is better than sacrifice. And to heed is better than the fat of rams. So when we read that, we can read into the fact that Jesus Christ tells us specifically, I desire mercy just like God. I do not want sacrifice or, as it says in 1 Samuel, the fat of lambs. I want you to obey me. That's what he requires. And Jesus reminds us of that. Obedience is valued far more than the sacrifices of these perfect animals. And where do we see this instant sacrifice of obeying? In Matthew. First time he met the man, all he did was say, follow me. He got up off of his chair and followed. Not the hundredth time he met him. Not the ten conversations he had prior to that. The first time he met him. It also says in Jeremiah 7, 22, for when I brought your ancestors out of Egypt and spoke to them, Again, God speaking directly to his people is kind of important. I did not just give them commands about burnt offerings and sacrifice. Now those are Old Testament laws, and we kind of all understand those to be that way. But I give them this command. This one's overlooked quite a bit, so we might want to pay close attention here. It says the first word, obey me. And I will be your God. And you will be my people. That's the hang of that the Jewish leaders were having. They knew the laws, but they picked and choose which ones they wanted to be important instead of all of them. They know that God wants them to sacrifice. Because he even made specific reasons as to why. He know that God wants them to burn incense. He wants the temple to be set up in a certain way. He wants the people that are representing him to look and appear differently. These are all Old Testament laws. But they missed obeying me. God speaks to these folks, which I'm sure that he probably has, he's probably given them some fairly, fairly clear direction. Then it comes down to them do they listen or do they walk away. In Matthew's case, no problem. I'm on it. Matthew's story is a wonderful example of what happens when you listen. God, when you accept it by Him, and what you do in that reaction, you share that with the people around you. It also highlights the importance of understanding that once you make that choice, you're passing. 
that's why it was forgotten. What you do going forward is not what matters. When we read that story from Matthew, Matthew talks about that moment that Jesus says, follow me. And then what he does. Throws a party for his friends. Jesus, the disciples, they all break bread. And we already know just by that story that Matthew was someone of wealth. He had a house big enough to house not only Jesus and his disciples of that particular moment, but also his friends. That's a pretty good sized house. And then to have the money to pay for all the food that these people were going to eat. That shows you that Matthew was wealthy. And he gets up and walks away from all. Because Jesus Christ said, follow me. What's really exciting to me about this particular story is once Matthew makes that decision, in the book of Matthew, Matthew does a wonderful job of documenting lots of things about Jesus' ministry. Lots of things about what the kingdom of heaven is like. The miracles that Jesus performed while he was here. The sermons that Jesus conducted. But not once after that moment does he ever refer to himself again as a sinner. Only
I thought we just had a prayer. Father God, thank you so much for the wonderful gifts that you bestowed on Matthew and his skills that were particularly used of a certain amount of people we call Rome. But Lord, thank you so much for guiding and leading Jesus to Matthew. To ask him to be his follower. To be in his heart to allow for him to say, yes, I will. And then for him to use those skills so that he could document his gospel so that we may benefit from his meticulous details. And more importantly, understand who he was and who he became so that we can have someone that we can relate to. Lord, thank you so much for your diligence and your continued love in seeking our hearts to further your kingdom. As this is Jesus' great name. Amen.